Last week we started a talk about um, compassion and um, com in particular um, trying to develop compassion in, in our daily life. Um, and I'd like to go over a few of the things that, that um, I brought up last week. Um, but, uh, but before I do, I'd like to, to point out to you that when we uh, do all this talking about compassion, uh, it's also dangerous like this thing, you know? uh, because we can mistake all the talking and all the words about compassion for uh, compassion. And uh, I was thinking about it this afternoon and it reminded me of um, something I remember well from my childhood. I don't know that it exists anymore, but when I was a child, um, if you didn't have much money uh, and you wanted to buy something, I'm not talking about children, I'm talking about adults, uh, you lay by things. You know? So you went to a shop, or where I grew up, a little van, a strange little van came around with a strange little man in a dust coat, and he opened the back of the van, and there were all sorts of things hanging in it, dresses and brooms and other things, and pots and pans, and your, usually your mother, or maybe your mother and grandmother, you know, went and looked, and they lay by things. They gave the man a small amount of money, and he drove off in the van with the goods and each week he would come back around or sometimes every couple of weeks or if it was in the city you went into one of the big department stores and you went to a special counter and you paid a shilling or two shillings or five shillings whatever it was sixpence um, some people are seeing this think, what? Um, and and they had a little card and they marked it off and you know, and then eventually when you'd paid the full amount and maybe it would take you a long time. Sometimes lay-bys took a very long time. And sometimes when you'd paid it off, they couldn't find it. It had been <laughs> stored away so carefully, it took them ages to find it. Then you actually got the goods. Now, it seems to me that in a strange way, compassion is a little bit like that. That, that all our efforts uh, at coming to real compassion are really like the lay-by. You know? We, we do this little thing and we do that little thing and so on. And none of it is compassion. You know? All of it is just an attempt to bring it a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer. You know? The difference between the lay-by and compassion is that when we finally get our lay-by of compassion, we don't know we've got it. It's a kind of a magical quality um, that uh, we are simply being compassionate. You know? So we don't actually go and and take the parcel down from the shelf and run home and think, oh, now I've got compassion. No, if you do that, you've still got the lay-by. <laughs> so it's important uh, at the outset to, to remember and to recall that all the words about it are not it. All the pointing at it is not it. All the flapping of jaws and everything else, that's not it. And I said to the people who were here last week, my own uh, lovely teacher in Thailand was very, very strong on this point. You know, and he used to regularly say to me, because compassion is very important in the Buddhist tradition, and, and if we all want to talk about it, you know, and also it's a nice thing, so it's a nice thing to talk about, you know, and that's why it's dangerous. You know. um, but he used to say to me all the time with his scrawny little fingers, he was a very scrawny little man, you know, and he'd poke me in the chest really, <laughs> really hard. You know? And he'd say, stop talking about compassion. There's no such thing. And you can imagine the, the first impact of that was really shocking. It was like, hang on, you know, I thought I was in a Buddhist monastery. I thought you were a teacher. And here you are telling me to stop talking about compassion. There's no such thing. You know? And he'd keep poking like this just to make sure you know, that you got the message. And then he'd say, there is only our effort at being compassionate today and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And I think that's a great lesson. Because otherwise we start to think that, you know, if we get all these theories about compassion, then somehow or other we've got compassion. Now the Buddha, this is not, of course, doesn't just apply to compassion, but it applies to all sorts of things uh, for the Buddha. It's the difference for the Buddha between these two ways or two modes of knowing, the Anubodha and Patiweda. Yeah? Anubodha is when we know something you know, in just a very ordinary way. 
<coughs> excuse me, and we have to have that kind of knowing. But patiweta is when I actually see right into the thing and it's penetrated, it's, if you like, struck, so to speak, my heart. And I know it from inside out, not from outside in. And so that has to be the way if we're going to understand and encounter and embody real compassion, that's how it needs to be. But even as I say those words, of course, they're not true because they're just words. So it's very important at the outset because I'm going to say all sorts of things, um, most of which is, is completely useless. There might be a word, there might be a break between two words, which is useful. Um, uh, anyway, you've got to do something. You can't just do nothing. Well, you can, but um, it's not terribly helpful. Um, so, so last week, <coughs> excuse me, when I was here uh, talking to the people who were here, um, I tried to point out that the Buddha keeps, when he wants to talk about compassion, he keeps going back to our human experience. You know, he doesn't talk about compassion um, in some sort of religious context or even in the ordinary sense of the word, some spiritual context. He keeps coming back to how we experience things ourselves. Right? And so he keeps referring to, to our own experience of compassion and when he wants to talk about a principal example that he gives or touchstone is that of the mother and her child. Right? And I think it's very important not to forget that. That that is, that is the, the best image that the Buddha himself can come up with that of the mother and the child. Now, remember, of course, that the Buddha is using that in a kind of an ideal fashion. He's not saying that your mother, perhaps, was the most compassionate mother in the world. If you're lucky, maybe she was. But, uh, but maybe she wasn't. Maybe she was a monster. But it doesn't mean that uh, the, the idea of the mother or the ideal of the mother can't be compassionate to the extent that the, the Buddha says that she would sacrifice her own life. So we talked a little bit about that last week and we talked about the, the fact that, that that is actually a part of being a human being. <coughs> now if you don't believe that, I can't do anything about it. But the very fact that you have the capacity to, to feel and to recognise feeling in others as I drove over here tonight, there was a long discussion about using uh, 1080 Bates um, on Radio National. Um, and, and there were all sorts of weird and wonderful views being given. You know, um, people saying, well, 1080, you know, once you take it, you don't really suffer. You know, you just have convulsions for a few hours. And, well, I'd call having convulsions suffering. And, and then other people saying, well, no, you can give it to every, uh, everything from snails down, but not from snails up. Yeah. Uh, then someone someone was talking about speciesism, and it was a pretty crazy discussion. Yeah. Um, but <coughs> um, in the context of uh, of compassion, uh, the Buddha keeps saying, "Okay, look at your experience, and look at the way that you have this capacity with regard to others." Now, where do we have it first? We mentioned this last week within our own family, in those early relationships. And the most uh, significant um, place where we first find it is within our mother's arms. Yeah. Now, as I said to you, it, it does not mean that we have to uh, personalise it and say, well, you know, my mother was pretty cold or my mother was... No. Right? We have to think about what does this, this idea of mother mean? Yeah? And then we can work with that. So the Buddha says, okay, that's, that's your first experience of it. It's also your first experience of a place which is safe, yeah? a place that you can take refuge in, in that place. He also points out that the mother does this without any expectation of reward. Usually the mother looks after the child and she's not there with a calculator saying, oh, well, you know, when, when she becomes a, um, you know, a paediatrician or when she becomes, you know, this and so on, then I'll be able to retire and, you know, and I'll make sure that she earns or he earns X amount of dollars a year and so on. No. 
But that doesn't enter into it. If it does, you know, there's something very wrong. You know? um, the mother does it almost because she can't help herself. And this is a little clue about the nature of real compassion. Real compassion can't help itself. Real compassion doesn't pick and choose. It doesn't say, oh, I'll be compassionate to you, but not to you. It's a little clue as to the nature of real compassion. And the Buddha says, okay, look at, look at that and see the way that within a family, within a small group of friends, people are compassionate to each other. But they're not doing it because, you know, if I'm compassionate to you, you'll be compassionate to me. They do it because of that kind of feeling for each other. Now, of course, there's self-interest in it, but that's not the predominant thing. Then the Buddha points out that after a while, as we grow up a little bit, we begin to recognise <coughs> that people outside our immediate circle, we start with those people, but then we begin to recognise that, you know, there are all these other people and they actually have the same kinds of feelings as I do. That, you know... Maybe we, we learn it the hard way. We learn it by hurting them. Yeah. Or we learn it by being hurt by them. Yeah. And we begin to recognise that. The Buddha points out that as we develop spiritually, we also begin to recognise our own essential emptiness. Yeah. Now this emptiness has a, has also has a painful side to it. But that painful side is very important because it, the painful side is a bit like the bushfire <coughs> in Australia, the bushfire that, that makes it possible for seeds to open you know, in Australian wild, uh, wild plants. Yeah. So the, the, <coughs> the pain of, of dukkha, this pain of, of feeling this kind of uh, emptiness yeah, that we begin to recognise is very important and we begin to see it in others and we can begin to feel for them. And so the Buddha says our compassion begins to spill over a little bit uh, and flow out to these other people as well. But again, we don't do it if it's real. We don't do it in the hope that they will do something for us. Yeah. We've been having at Sangha Lodge over the last few weeks a whole series of talks on what does the Buddha really mean by dana yeah. as a way of trying to get some balance back into teaching on dana. Yeah. And, th and this teaching on compassion and the teaching on dana are actually also very intimately connected because real dana also has this quality of not expecting a reward. Real dana is not reciprocal. That's ordinary human giving. I give something to you, and I, in the back of my mind, I think, mm, yeah, I give it to you, you're my friend, and when my birthday comes, I wonder what they're going to give me. <laughs> it's true. Yeah? Um, yeah. Um, I told some people at Sangha Lodge, in Burma, I don't know if they still do it, but in Burma they used to have this wonderful practice where they would keep a notebook. And you would write down all the good things you did. Huh? And this was keeping a record of your merit. Huh? So you actually had a little notebook and, and you could produce it. You know? I guess you could go along to your favourite monk and say, hey, look at this. You know? Like coupons during the war. Huh? I can cash all these in and get all this. It's nonsense. Huh? Well, similarly, if we approach compassion that way, that's also nonsense. Huh? Not according to me. It doesn't matter what. I think about things according to the Buddha. So the Buddha says, as we begin to grow up, as we begin to develop our capacity to empathise with others, to feel you know, with others, to feel for others, then our compassion begins to grow and to develop. Now, of course, our compassion is still like the lay-by. We still have to work at it. We still have to make an effort. We have to think about it. And that's, that's really part also of practising sati, you know, being recollected, you know, or practising contemplation. You know. I don't mean in a, excuse me, in a formal way, I don't mean sitting down and saying, now I'm going to do compassion practice. That's, that's good and that's necessary and it's very helpful. But I'm talking about in, in ordinary day-to-day -day life, every now and again, recalling, is there compassion in this interaction that I'm now engaged in? A little tiny thought like that. I've told some of you before, you know, there's a wonderful 
monk teacher who's not in Australia anymore, unfortunately, Achan Bunyarit, who was in Adelaide and now lives back in Thailand. He's very, very old. He must be... I saw him off at the airport with Chakun Samai some years ago and he was 95 then, so mm -hmm. he must be getting close to 100. You know? And he always talked about, when he talked about meditation practice, he said, no, not all this stuff about, you know, I do it at 7 in the morning, 6 in the morning, 6 at night, and so on. No. I practice meditation every time the thought of practice arises in the mind, that's when I practice. Yeah? It's a very, very good way to practice, if you can do it. Yeah? Now, what does he mean? He doesn't mean, it, I'm, I'm on the bus going to work, the thought of meditation, so I jump off the bus and run home and light some incense and sit. No! He means I do it immediately. I bring myself, so to speak, into my meditative space or place yeah? within this body, this heart, this mind. So likewise, with compassion, when the thought of compassion arises, we have to, in a sense, ground ourselves in compassion in that moment. Yeah? And we can do that by recognising, oh, OK, what is this feeling? What is this thought? Right? What's this movement of the heart and mind right? of the chitta? So the Buddha says, when we begin to mature, we begin to recognise the suffering of others, we recognise our emptiness and their emptiness, yeah? their essential emptiness. And that means, even if the person is absolutely monstrous, and then there are plenty of monstrous people around. There are plenty of monstrous monks and nuns, believe me. Um, there are lots of monstrous people around, but we can be compassionate with them. You know? Because we can recognise the same emptiness that, that we share with them. You know? Otherwise, they wouldn't be monstrous. Because that monstrousness is a symptom of that, that terrible suffering that they're experiencing. So, the Buddha says we then make more of an effort you know, to be compassionate to, toward those people. And what's the highest form of compassion? The highest form of compassion is one uh, in which there is no I being compassionate. There's no you receiving the compassion and there's no compassion being so to speak, transmitted. So there's no uh, lay by, no lay buyer, and and no goods to be collected at the end. You know? um, and it's interesting because the highest kind of dana, according to the Buddha, is the same. You know? The best kind of dana, according to the Buddha, is between two enlightened beings, you know? where one gives to the other, you know? but there's actually no no transaction you know, takes place. Now, <coughs> you might say, well, that sounds, you know, uh, OK, that sounds a bit sort of airy-fairy. It, it's probably impossible. And, uh, and other people think that it's impossible. Yeah. Um, and if, you, if you're interested in philosophy, um, then you'll know a philosopher called Jacques Derrida, and he says it is impossible. Yeah. He says that that kind of gift, that kind of uh, thing, it's just impossible. It's a nice ideal. The Buddha says... No, it's not impossible. You can do it. You can realise it. Right? So this kind of compassion is realisable. Right? But, of course, it's a kind of paradox. Right? We have to approach it... Um, we have to approach it in a very kind of careful, cautious way. Right? If we approach it in a grasping way, it, we're never going to realise it. Right? So if we become the kind of person who who uh, makes compassion into some kind of uh, ideal that I'm going to strive after and I am going to get, then you're never going to get real compassion. You'll get something and it might look like compassion and it might even feel a little bit like compassion, but it won't be real compassion because it will, in fact, be an expression of utter, of self, of I. And I mentioned last week that this is, this is a problem uh, for many people today, that a lot of what appears to be compassionate action is tainted by other things today. Very often tainted by anger and resentment. Yeah. So I'm very compassionate towards you because I don't see or I fail to see that I'm actually angry about something or I'm resentful about something and, and so I, I try to address it in you. Yeah. I try to, to solve my problem by being compassionate towards you. So you're, the, you're, in a funny way, you're my victim. You know? uh, but really, I see myself as the victim. You know? It's very complex. The same thing can be said about the idea of holiness. You know? When I try 
too hard uh, for holiness. When I make holiness into something out here, uh, something solid, uh, then I'm going to get it, but it will actually turn out to be something very poisonous and, and very dangerous. So the Buddha says this is, this is, if you like, the highest stage of compassion. And uh, he uh, teaches in numerous places in the suttas uh, that this is uh, the, the best kind of compassion, the kind of compassion that arises, if you like, we could say spontaneously. It arises in response to uh, a situation uh, in which we encounter dukkha, in which we encounter suffering uh, in another person. Now, compassion also um, has to have some feeling quality, but it doesn't have to involve uh, feeling sorry for someone. So it can't fall over into pity. My own teacher was very strong on this. Is what you are feeling compassion or do you feel pity for the person? Pity, Pity for the person is perhaps we could put it this way, is a, is a very low-grade kind of compassion. Uh, compassion seeks to actually reach out to the person. Uh, pity says, oh, I feel sorry for you. Well, I can in life, I can feel sorry for lots of people and feel sorry about lots of things. Ask um, Mr Howard and, and company what they feel sorry for at the moment, um, what they should have felt sorry for some time ago. Um, that's not uh, compassion, that kind of feeling sorry. So um, it has to have that, uh, that dimension, but it doesn't depend on that dimension, uh, on that, that feeling quality. But it's not uh, a dry intellectual thing. Uh, some people seem to think that, uh, that the Buddha somehow uh, was vacant of all feeling. But if you read the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, you regularly find the Buddha and Ananda travelling as they do in that incredibly long sutta, and the Buddha keeps leaving places, and he experiences these kinds of feelings for these places, and he says to Ananda, this is such a wonderful place, such a beautiful place, and this is the last time I'll look on this place. Well, this is not, you know, some sort of dry... uh, philosophical thing. This is a whole thing, the whole body, heart and mind working together. And compassion has to have that element as well. So it can't just be an idea. But on the other hand, it can't be allowed to fall over into a kind of sentimentality. Because then, you know, sentimentality after all is about me. It's about how I feel. It's about how I become upset, you know. As we get older, very often we become more sentimental anyway, um, in, in different, different ways. You know? uh, we, watch, we might see the news you know? and, and we become more uh, disturbed in a sentimental way about what we see on the news. But that's not the same thing as compassion. So this highest level of compassion is the one that we ought to aim for, but it's very hard to aim for it in a good way, in a pure way. So we have to constantly keep, so to speak, sweeping the path of compassion so that real compassion arises, not something else that looks like it, and then we discover that's not it. Um, And last week I gave people examples um, of uh, of the emphasis the Buddha places on uh, things like desire and feeling and so on (coughs) as springboards uh, for this kind of thing to arise. And so when he talks to a village headman, for example, he says, you know, um, how come in... I'm, I'm really compressing it, but he says, how come in this village there's a certain group of people, if something bad hap- excuse me, happens to them, you feel really bad about it? There's another group of people in the village you couldn't care less. You know, he uses very strong examples. He says, you know, if this person was murdered or arrested or jailed and so on, he says, you know, here you are, you'll be weeping and carrying on. And in the same village... You know, these people, this happens to them, and it has no effect on you whatsoever. Um, And the Buddha tries to point out that this is because of the kind of grasping and desire uh, which leads uh, in in an unskillful, unwholesome uh, direction. Um, But he doesn't say that there's something wrong with the feeling itself, uh, with that, that capacity. 
there's a pr- real problem in, in the Theravadan tradition, this, this mis-identifying uh, of the role of uh, feeling at this kind of level, um, and particularly in the Thai tradition, um, where the, the image of the Arahant is like a lump of wood. You know? So you see all these wonderful pictures in Thai. You know? uh, old, old men looking like they're dead. You know? And people say, oh, this, this, this is wonderful, Benpa Arahant. Well, when I was living in Thailand, I met some of these Benpra Alahan. They're just old men. Yeah? And maybe they meditate. And very often they're just asleep. Yeah? And maybe they meditate. Um, but they have no feeling. They, what they have is disinterest. Yeah? It's not that they're liberated at all. Yeah? But they, they are uninterested. Yeah? It's as though they've given up. It's a bit like we've been, at Sangha Lodge, we've been studying the Jataka of King Siwi. And King Siwi says, uh, towards the end of that Jataka story, after he's given his eyes away, and Saka, king of the gods, comes to him and says, you know, um, what are you doing? He said, I'm just waiting for death. Yeah. Well, that's what that's uh, like, that image of the, the Arahant. That's, if you look at the Buddha, the Buddha nothing like that. The Buddha himself. You look at the, the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta. You don't find the Buddha sort of going... <laughs> like it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's terribly important because that, sadly, is the image that's presented to people, and so then that's the image that they think they should be trying to strive for. But you, if you actually look at what the what is the Buddha like in that very last uh, sutta, he's nothing like that. He, despite his age, despite his sickness, he, in that sutta he says, "I'm like an old cart held together by leather pieces of leather, leather straps." He's nonetheless really vibrant. He's teaching the whole time. He's making his sickness part of his teaching. And his concern always is for their well-being and happiness. He's not like someone who's cashing in his chips at the casino, you know, I think I'll go home now. No. Right up until the end, even, even at the end where the disciples say to him, but you haven't nominated anyone to be the leader. And he points out to them, yes, I have. I've given you the Dhamma. He says, you know, be you, uh, that horrible old translation, be ye lamps unto yourself. (coughs) Um, But then he follows it up immediately, in case we get attached to the utter, to self, he follows it up with, uh, let the Dhamma uh, be an island for you. So that's um, the kind of compassionate engagement that I'm talking about. Not some, some dry, shriveled up idea of, of being compassionate by just withdrawing from everything yeah. and watching with a kind of a disinterest uh, what's, what's going on. Um, so, um, we looked also briefly at uh, the fact that the Buddha's own mother died uh, when he was very, very young. In, according to this traditional story, he was only seven days old and his mother died, and, and, uh, and how the Buddha talks about this uh, with uh, Ananda as an example of the way in which uh, even the mothers of Bodhisattvas and Buddhas um, pass away, uh, and how we have to come to terms with this in our life. And then uh, very briefly, I'm not sure whether I mentioned this last week, the wonderful story about Sariputta's passing away, and how uh, Kunda comes to Ananda, and he's terribly distressed, he's a novice, and he gives Ananda uh, sorry, Buddha's bowl and robe, and Ananda becomes really upset. Yeah? And Ananda's the most wonderful figure in the in the suttas, yeah? um, um, because I think he's he's more like us than the others. The others very often are too perfect. They're you know they're arahants. They're they're okay, yeah? and they've got all sorts of wonderful powers and everything. But and all Ananda has is a good heart. Yeah? And he's, he's constantly wanting to understand. Yeah. He's the one who goes to the Buddha and says, I think I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when the Buddha says, OK, tell me, he tells him, the Buddha says, no, that's not it. <laughs> yeah. He's also the one, interestingly, who really sticks up for the women. Yeah. He's the one who encourages the Buddha yeah. to allow Mahapajapatikotami yeah, to become a bhikkhuni. He's the one who, uh, going back to Mahapajapati Gautami, when she wants to offer the Buddha some robes, uh, 
and, uh, and the Buddha says, no, no, give them to the Sangha. Now, for very good reasons, which we won't go into tonight, but he says, give them to the Sangha. And three times she says, please, I made them myself. I made them with my own hands. Yeah? But this was no ordinary woman. She's the wife of the king. Yeah? She makes these things herself. She offers them to the Buddha. He says, give them to the Sangha. And who steps in? Ananda. Yeah? She says, oh, look... She's made them herself and she's brought them to you. And, you know, and then he runs through this fantastic list of things that she has done for the Buddha. And he starts off with, when your mother died, she suckled you. Yeah? So he goes right back to the beginning. So he touches on compassion and then he runs through and then towards the end he changes it and says, and you have done so many things for her. So he's establishing this connection between the two of them. And he says, therefore, uh, you should accept these things. Well, of course, as so often happens, this becomes an opportunity for the Buddha to give a teaching about why it's better to give, you know, on a more general uh, basis. But anyway, that's not what tonight's about. Um, so, <coughs> um, it's, uh, it's that kind of um, approach to compassion that, that we need to try to work at and work with. So we finished um, last week somewhere around that point. I can't remember. A lot's happened in the week in between. Um, so if this technology was perfect, of course, it would immediately cut in and, and uh, we'd know what happened last week. But, um, <laughs> but we don't. So, um, so how can... What I'd like to spend a few minutes on now is what concrete practical things can we do? Right? If we really believe that we can establish this kind of compassion or this kind of being compassionate, then, then what sorts of things uh, can we do? Well, one of them I think I've mentioned already. One of them is to use sati, to use reflection, to use recollection, to use contemplation, to remind ourselves during the day of this quality, to remind ourselves of how important it is and to actually let it arise. So when we're with somebody else, or when we're in a situation where, where we actually, if we're quiet enough within ourselves, we can detect the movement of, of karuna, of compassion within ourselves, then let it come up. Yeah? And don't, don't be held back by, oh, you know, it's a, you know, maybe I shouldn't say, maybe I shouldn't do, and so on. Yeah? If, it, if, it's, if it's authentic compassion, it will be a great blessing to the person. That's very different to, to pretending that your mother compassion strolling about, you know, being compassionate to everybody. You know, that kind of person's a pain in the neck. You know? um, I say that with great authority from the work I do in the hospital. There's nothing worse than the cheery hospital visitor you know, who's come <laughs> to spread compassion to everybody. And the patient, by the time they look, the patient wants to kill them. You know? <laughs> um, they want to reach out of their bed and strangle them. You know? The staff are happy to see the end of them yeah? <laughs> because it's, it's inauthentic. Yeah? It's not real. Now, that doesn't mean they're, they're a bad person, not at all. No? But it means there's lots of average <coughs> uh, ignorance there. So, so, first of all, actually reminding ourselves uh, of compassion, of its place within our lives and how to develop it. The second thing which we can do in a very concrete way is to practice, as the Buddha advises, the Brahma Viharas. Okay? And I've said this so many times that I almost am fearful of saying it again. The Brahma Viharas are essential parts of practice. They're not optional extras. You know, like when you buy a car, you know, will I have air conditioning? Will I have GPS? Will I don't know. Um, if you're going to follow the path of the Buddha, then the Brahma Viharas are an essential part of that path. And what are they? Loving kindness, metta, uh, karuna, mudita, and upeka. Yeah? And they all go together. They work together. They are, in a sense, a unity. They feed on each other and they feed each other. So, to actually cultivate those. Yeah? Again, we need to reflect on them. Again, we need to think about them. So, it can't be, it can't be a mindless kind of thing, yeah? this cultivation of compassion. It can't be like, oh, um, I think compassion's good and I hope that it will happen. Well, you can sit around for the rest of your life hoping it will happen. It will never happen if that's all you do. Right? So these are practical ways the Buddha has given us to try to develop these things. 
And he actually says, develop one and the other one will begin to arise and begin to flow out of it. So we try then uh, to bring into our meditation practice, whatever shape or form it might take, we try to bring some uh, practice of, of uh, karuna as a meditative practice uh, into it. Now there are many, many ways to do that. There are very, very, very formal ways, but there are also ways of doing it when, even when you're doing breath practice as you begin. Uh, um, when you, uh, for example, let yourself begin to rest into your own body, and you can, you can reflect for a few moments, am I compassionate toward this body? Am I compassionate towards the bodies of others? Now, I know this might sound like a strange thing, but, but for many of us, there's an awful lot of judging that goes on every single day when we encounter people. And the stranger somebody else is, often, the more judging goes on. So if you go into the city, and you see all sorts of people, if you watch your own mind, and here I don't mean in an obsessive fashion, but if you just cultivate a little bit of awareness and you begin to see, oh, you know, there's all sorts of aversion going on, you know, oh, this kind of person, that kind of person, and so on. And there's also, of course, attraction going on. There's also quite a lot of the kind of disinterest that I was just talking to you about a kind of ignoring, like these people don't even come onto my radar you know, because they're not, you know, they're not important. You know, they're not part of my world, you know, my loka. So, practicing uh, compassion, starting to uh, work with compassion as, sort of as a lay-by by doing those things as, as well. You know. um, spiritual reading the right kind of spiritual reading is also a very important way that we can cultivate compassion. If we read, like there, there are so many books available now and so many good books available now uh, that address or talk about or point towards this kind of area. Uh, um, well, if we find one of these books or get some of these books or if we look at the suttas uh, and, and read them with a view to examples of compassion that we can find there um, and reflect on them, read reflectively, not read them like we read the Herald or something, um, then that's also a way of slowly, little by little, you know, bit by bit, building up <coughs> pardon me, um, the compassionate heart within ourselves. Of course, you can turn it around and use a different image. You can say it slowly, little by little, bit by bit, sandpapering away the non-compassionate heart. It yeah. doesn't matter what sort of image you want to use, as, as long as you're aware of what you're doing uh, and going in a, in a good direction. So there's that, there's that kind of uh, thing that, that we can do, which is very, very practical. There's also um, the, what monks often do is to review at the end of the day, and nuns, I should say, review at the end of the day what they've actually done uh, that day. And you can pick, my teacher used to say, Pick some particular thing, like compassion, like how compassionate was I today? How much being compassionate went on today in my life? Yeah? Now you can choose one of the other Brahma Viharas as well if you want to. You know, how much loving kindness was there in my life today? How much mudita? You know, the, the most neglected, I think, of the Brahma Viharas. This, the one that's got the most awful name as well, sympathetic joy. This, this quality, this capacity, which is so very, very important of being truly joyful and happy at the good fortune and well-being of others. How much of that was in my life today? So we can, we can look um, at those things consciously, deliberately, you know, focus on them with the, the mind, bring the heart to bear on them and see, okay, what was there today? So this is, this is using our uh, human intelligence uh, in order to work or to foster the arising of this quality which we see as so important. Now, if you don't think it's important, well, that's fine. Don't do it. There's an, there, I'm, not, um, I'm not telling you you have to do this or any of these things. But I don't see how you can possibly uh, walk the path of the Buddha without 
at some point having compassion fall on you like a tree you know, across the path. Um, and you have to somehow negotiate uh, what this means in, in your own life. Now, I brought, I always like to bring um, some pseudo material. Um, and, uh, oh, that's right, last week we also talked a little bit about Shantideva and, uh, and compassion, and particularly the way that Shantideva encourages us to keep making an effort. Uh, he's very big on that, you know, so don't, don't give up. You know? Don't think that just because it seems uh, impossible that you should therefore give up. No, he says that have real trust and confidence in the Buddha. You know? Recognise that you're just like everybody else, and therefore, uh, you need, in the same way that you'd want to help yourself, you should want to help others and just get on with it and, uh, and do it. So, um, he ends in verse 95, he says, When happiness is something equally liked, both by myself and others, what's so special about me that I strive after happiness for myself alone? Um, Also, I think um, when, as, as people who say we're following the path of the Dhamma, we take refuge. And we take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dhamma and the Sangha. If we want to choose a particular area uh, of the Dhamma, like compassion, then we can, when we take refuge, uh, and you can do this over a week or over a couple of weeks or over a month, we can make taking refuge in the compassion of the Buddha part of our practice. So we think of the compassion of the Buddha particularly, you know, specifically, and we take refuge in that. Now that's a very powerful and special thing to do because I pointed out to the people who were here last week, in my own experience, one of the things that we very often lack, especially in the West, is any real compassion for ourselves. There's a big emphasis on being compassionate towards others and there's very often a big absence of real compassion for ourselves. There's lots of self-pampering. You know, that's not the same thing, mm. you know. Um, today I had to go and see someone, and I stopped and had a cup of coffee before going in to visit this person. You know? And the lady who was in the little canteen at the hospital said to me, oh, you're here to visit someone again. You know? And I said, yeah. But um, she said, uh, it's good to look after yourself first. Yeah, with, a, with a cup of coffee. Yeah? Now, her, her intention was good. Yeah? Um, but I think underneath that you can see that she's actually pointing out something that, that, uh, that's very true. Yeah? That there's a big difference between being compassionate to myself and being self-indulgent. Yeah? Um, so if we think about the compassion of the Buddha, yeah? um, then we encounter all sorts of things. We encounter, for example, the honesty of the Buddha in his compassion. So when we think of concrete examples like the Buddha uh, coming into, into contact with Patachara, that's especially in the case of uh, the w early women. Uh, Patachara um, with uh, Gotami, um, various um, of the early women disciples of the Buddha, um, he is moved by compassion, but what is, what is his response? His response is to put in front of them what is true not in a judgmental way, but simply to place it there. You know? There's a very famous verse in, 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 in when he encounters... Um, oh, I've forgotten the name now of the lady. Um, but she's mourning over the death of her, of her child. You know? And there's a play on words, jiwaka. You know? And he says, which, which jiwaka are you mourning for? You know? uh, this one, this one, thousands of them have, have died today. Which one are you mourning for? Now, if that could be said in a really harsh and hard way, yeah? and, and you sometimes you hear people say, not that, but they'll say, I'll oh, get over it. You know? yeah, you, you'll get over it, don't worry. Yeah? But no, the Buddha does it in a very, very compassionate way, and he puts in front of this woman, you know, okay, there is, there is the death that you've experienced, but what about all these others? Yeah? So he puts it back, like putting a jewel back into the setting that it belongs in. And, of course, uh, most uh, beautifully, he does it in the story of Kisukotami uh, and her dead child, uh, where he puts her back into the village, says, I'll help you. Notice he doesn't say, I'll restore the child to life. He says, I'll help you. 
but you've got to do something for me first, knowing, of course, she'll do anything. If the Buddha had said, saw your legs off, she would have done it. Right? And you know that's true. Yeah? Um, that uh, if, it's, if it's a question of saving your child, you'll do anything. Yeah? Um, and she says, yes, anything. And he says, go to the village and get me. Um, and she probably thought, this is fantastic. Yeah? All I've got to do is go. And then, of course, the Buddha drops the truth yeah? into it and says, just make sure it comes from a house which has never experienced death. Now, she probably thinks, no, no worries. I'll easily find that. Yeah? Um, she goes, and of course she doesn't find it. Uh, what she finds is a great willingness to give the mustard seed, yeah? but no one can give it who hasn't been touched by death. And so, so in this giving her the truth, yeah, it's a great act of compassion because he arouses compassion in the villagers. Yeah? She is touched by the compassion, and her own compassion is able to arise because she's faced with their dukkha, their suffering, and, and that liberates her. Yeah? So she comes back and, and she becomes a disciple of the Buddha. She's able to let go. Now, the mistake we can make is we think she you know, chucks the baby away and thinks, oh, right, okay, now I get on with my spiritual life. No, of course, she would still uh, carry with her uh, the death of that child. But she's no longer uh, bound by it. She's now no longer tied down by it. Uh, mm. So there's a, there's a lovely verse by Dogen Zenji about um, living um, for years and years and years. He says, I've lived in this monastery in my mountain retreat uh, and uh, practiced you know, all day. And we all know how, how rigorous uh, some of those Zen practitioners are. Um, and, and he says, and yet even I cannot fail to be moved uh, by the beauty of these dropping leaves. Uh, so he sees impermanence. Uh, and he doesn't, uh, it's not an intellectual exercise, he doesn't sort of say, well, oh, yeah, impermanence, anicchati. I remember reading that in the suttas. Uh, no, his whole body, heart and mind come together and he is touched uh, and compassion arises in him in the face of impermanence. So, when we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, we can look for, if we, want to, if we want to work with compassion, we can try to look for compassion in the Buddha. We can look for the compassion in the Dhamma of the Buddha. We can also look for it, take it in the way that the Buddha taught it to uh, Mahapajapati Gautami, when she went and asked for the Dhamma, and the Buddha says, look in your own heart and mind, yeah, and see there those things which lead to dispassion, not to passion, to letting go, not to taking up, and so on. So we can look there and see, okay, where is compassion yeah. here? And even, the big surprise is, even if I find, gee, there's not much compassion here, then I can actually kick a little bit of compassion up for myself. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, you know, I'm pretty hopeless and I haven't got any compassion. No, let a little bit of compassion arise yeah, for my lack of compassion. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, you, can, you can do it. And likewise, uh, when we take refuge in the Sangha, yeah, we can, of course we can think about the Arya Sangha, the Noble Sangha, think about their compassion. Yeah. And I think it's particularly vivid in the life of those early women disciples of the Buddha. If you look at the way they lived together, yeah, the way they interacted, the way they took care of each other, it's very, very clear. On the other hand, if you look at some of the early groups of monks, it's not so clear. And in fact, the Buddha himself chastises some of them for their behaviour. It's very interesting. But anyway, it's another hobby horse. Um, so I'll get off that one and go back to where we're going. But we can also think about the Sangha as like us, <coughs> like us now. Yeah. This is a Sangha, not just this. Yeah. This, this group of people who are trying to practice together. Yeah. Um, this is a Sangha. So, so where is the compassion there? Yeah. Where is the compassion for each other? And when, like when we come together tonight, so I know some of you, and some of you I know well, and some of you I don't know at all, some of you I've never seen before, um, but I have to make an effort to be compassionate with all of you, and I hope that you'll make a compa an effort to be compassionate to me. Yeah? So if you're th sitting there thinking, oh, when's he going to finish? <laughs> 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 be compassionate, you know? 
Don't, we all do that, don't worry. I had to sit through once a two hour Dhamma talk with a friend of mine who's a monk. And I, I'm very serious when I say to you that, that 10 minutes into the talk, I realised I had no idea what he was talking about. It was a very, very heavy foreign accent. <laughs> And <laughs> I think Judith knows who this is. <laughs> and, and two hours this talk went for, and ten minutes in I thought, oh, I think it's time to retreat into the meditative capsule. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he talked on, and when we finished and we went back to the, the little Sangha house, he said, I won't do the accent because you'll know who it is. <laughs> he said to me, that was a marvellous talk. And I said, was it was a tad long. And he said, but they loved it. <laughs> um, so you've got to be compassionate for him too yeah? um, for being so deluded but anyway so and then the next thing yeah, um, after thinking about taking refuge and then we, we might think about compassion um, in terms of generating the desire to be of help to others generating the desire to be of benefit to others but in a really wise way yeah? With, with Panya, with wisdom. And notice, very often when the Buddha talks about them, they go together, wisdom and compassion, compassion and wisdom. There's a beautiful Mahayana, um, long, long uh, verse thing called the the, uh, the Royal Song of Saraha. Um, and it ends with these beautiful three or four verses about the relationship between compassion and wisdom. And it says that one without the other is dangerous, one without the other doesn't work, you know, you have to have the, the two together. Right? And you, you only have to look at the life of the Buddha to see it. Yeah? You don't even have to look at the formal teaching of the Buddha, you can see it in the life of the Buddha, this kind of compassion. And you can see him being compassionate with his disciples as well. And you can see, uh, to be fair to them, you can see the disciples also being compassionate. So, um, cultivating then the desire to be of benefit to others, to be compassionate towards others and so on. And this again is something that we need to do consciously. Yeah. It's not like, you know, I don't know whether they still exist, but <coughs> years ago there were, you know, you want to learn a foreign language, you could go and buy these things and put them on and go to bed. Yeah? What a heap of... <laughs> yeah? Like, oh, I think I'll study theoretical maths, you know, just get the tapes and, and go to bed. Yeah? There was even, I kid you not, there was even someone who was selling a set, and I listened to them, and this is living proof they don't work, um, you could become enlightened by listening to these particular sounds, yeah? particular wave patterns. This guy's name was Master Charles. I hope I don't offend anyone who's a friend of his. Um, and he used to flog off these tapes. It was utter rubbish. It was someone tuning a, a shortwave radio, you know. And you'd sit there going, ah. <laughs> um, yeah? no, it has, to, it has to be worked at. It has to use the body, the heart, the mind. Yeah? There's no shortcut to compassion except the shortcut of dropping self. Yeah? That's the only, the only shortcut. So, so trying to do that. And then finally, um, coming to an end, so you can relax, is we started off last week with those five things the Buddha said it was, it was good to think about often. Yeah? And the last of those is that I am the owner of my karma. Yeah? And if I think about that in terms of compassion, okay, then it is a good and a necessary and a beneficial thing to uh, develop compassion uh, for others and to develop compassion for myself. To, to, so to speak, make myself a more compassionate being. But I have, to, I have to do it in a, in a sensitive and a sensible way. Yeah. So there's no, there's no new age trick to compassion. Yeah. Um, it has to actually be, be worked at. And if you, again, if you look at the life of the Buddha, look at the Jatakas. I know some people don't like the Jatakas and, and some people refuse to read them as the stories they are. They want to lit read them in a literal fashion. You, you can read them that way, but it won't do any good. Um, and what do you see? All the time you see the Buddha developing, 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 moving towards, uh, as a bodhisattva, moving towards the point at which he takes birth as uh, the Buddha, or as the person who's about to, to become the Buddha. Um, 
So our cultivation of compassion has to be something like that. We work at it, work at it, and we use all the things that we can uh, to help us. Uh, and according to my own teacher, the most important things that we use are the most ordinary and those that are closest to us. Yeah. So we have to work on developing compassion in our relationships with, with others. Yeah. So it's no, you know, it's no good being some big time teacher, for example, and having no compassion. Uh, a friend of mine told me they went to, to do a retreat with someone who's very famous for writing on, uh, on compassion and loving kindness and so on, and they came back and they said, I said, how was the retreat? They said, one day he's the rudest man I've ever met. Huh? Um, knows all about it, but actually can't practice it. Yeah? Can give you all the instructions, but can't do it. Huh? Um, there are a few Christian theologians like that. Um, who um, w one of them actually admitted that um, he was a very famous Protestant theologian who, when he died and they had his funeral, about six mistresses turned up, um, <laughs> which was quite a surprise to his wife and to each other. Um, <laughs> he was a brilliant theologian, yeah, but he couldn't practice it. Yeah. So that's no good. Um, what we need is to, is to stay with small things and to, to try to practice and develop small things and then uh, we've got some hope of actually coming into contact and with and fostering uh, real compassion. Mm.